The time is at hand. The elusive dog-like creature attacks livestock, bleeding them dry of blood. Eight to ten feet tall, shadowy aliens. But I am telling you right now. We need a great reset. And this, and this is, is extremely, extremely dangerous, dangerous to our democracy. Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. Welcome to In Dark Places. I'm your Huckleberry, Junebug Fugit. I live in a little speck of earth known as Williamson, West Virginia. There's nothing to do here except for just ride around and count how many crackheads we can see. We tend to spend a lot of our time over in Pikeville, Kentucky, about 30 minutes away. A couple weeks ago I talked about the FEMA coffins going by at a particular intersection in Pikeville, Kentucky. I've had another strange occurrence there. Me and Brandon were there one night and we were stuck at the red light that stays red for like 10 minutes and there was a guy waiting to turn in on the other lane across from us. He was coming our way in a white Chevy Silverado and he had it all decked out, light up wheels and weird lights pointing at the ground and stuff trying to draw attention to himself. Hey look at me and my truck. We didn't think much of it. The light turned green. We left. A couple nights later, the same exact thing happened. We were sitting there at that red light, and there was a white Chevy Silverado in that same exact lane turning in that direction where we were coming from. He had the lights all around his truck and everything. Again, <laughs> same exact vehicle. But wait, there's more. A couple nights after that, we did the same thing again. We were sitting there at that red light waiting to get across. This white Chevy Silverado pulled up in the lane across the road with his left turn signal on, getting ready to come our direction with all of his fancy lights around his truck. Same truck. Three times in a row. Was it a glitch in the matrix? Who knows? But that's what we're talking about this week. Glitches in the matrix. Parallel universes different dimensions, ghosts, people that somehow creep through into our reality. This week on the show. This week's episode of In Dark Places is sponsored by ABC Thursday Nights. Thursday, Connor's father comes to class. Hey, who is this guy? Without this guy, I wouldn't be in school today. Who are you, the bus driver? <laughs> then Roger goes to the hospital. Why it? What are you yelling at? Don't you know there's sick people here? It's what's happening right after Cotter. Tomorrow night, starting at 8 on ABC. That's Thursday night on ABC, starting at 8 o'clock, 7 central. I can't wait. Thanks, Jimmy. Mysterious appearances and disappearances bulk large among the inexplicable happenings that fill the archives of the paranormal. They are frequently an important part of poltergeist activity. Elusive, though the relevant evidence is, those who study such cases often become convinced that objects apparently normal in all other respects can suddenly appear from nowhere, and that may mean from another dimension. A well-documented example of such an event involved a couple enjoying lunch with two guests in the Brazilian town of Jabuta Cabo in 1966. In their own words, just as Mrs. Diaz instinctively looked at the ceiling, she saw a stone fall, as if it had come from the ceiling. But when it was about five feet from the floor, it split into two separate pieces, each of which fell in the opposite direction to the other. Mrs. Diaz quickly picked up the two pieces of stone and found that they fit together with a strong magnetic attraction. The others present were able to repeat this several times until the stone gradually lost its magnetic force. Neighbors of the family were also involved in a poltergeist manifestation, which was unusually well witnessed. During this, a local dentist 
Mr. Zhao Valpe amassed no less than 312 stones, one weighing over 8 pounds, that had been flung into his house. The happenings apparently centered on an 11 year old girl. The stones appeared from all directions, yet only once was anyone hit when a stone appeared in midair, tapped three people lightly on the head, and fell to the floor. The witnesses reported that the sensation was like that of being hit by a ball of compressed air. In 1977, a professional photographer, Graham Morris, was less fortunate. He was struck hard on the forehead by a flying toy brick at the moment he released his shutter. His photograph shows two people facing him, one with folded arms and the other with hands in pockets. So who threw the brick? This took place in the early days of the Enfield Poltergeist case, which several witnesses saw stones, coins, and even a paper handkerchief fall to the floor, as if they had come through the ceiling. Other incidents at Enfield that violated accepted laws of physics included a teleportation of a book into the house next door, which was witnessed by people in both houses. The appearance in midair of a piece of plastic for the eyes of a relative of the family involved, and most remarkably of all, the sudden appearance of a large cushion on the roof of the house, witnessed by several astonished passers-by. Similar incidents have been reported since the year 530 A.D., when Helpoditis, a deacon and physician, described numerous showers of stones inexplicably falling in his own house. The similarity of reports from places as widely separated as Brazil, Sumatra, Muratitis, and England lends him a degree of collective credibility. I can't tell you how many times I've been looking for my keys or whatever, and they're not where I left them, and then I go back a few minutes later, and there they are. You ever have stuff like that happen? Is this some kind of a little trickster hiding stuff from you? Or do they just kind of disappear into another dimension? What's the deal? A spontaneous occurrence that happened to be well observed involved a Swedish researcher, Jan Fellander, and the English psychic Matthew Manning at that time, a poltergeist victim. When Philander left his laboratory with Manning, he locked it using the three locks on the door then went with Manning to his apartment, where he placed his bunch of keys on a table. After lunch, the keys had disappeared, and Philander had to call a colleague for a duplicate set. On arriving back to the laboratory, there were the keys he had left at home. Inside a closed drawer, he knew and I knew his keys had traveled right through Stockholm, Manning said. A lot of times I'll be looking for the scotch tape or like a safety pin or just some general object of some sort and I'll go and look exactly where I laid it and it's not there. I asked my wife and Brandon, where is that thing at? And they say it's sitting in there, whatever. I go in there and look and it's back. It makes no sense. I have stuff like that happen all the time though. Why? What does it mean? story was sent in by Tim, OG listener. Thanks, Tim. Last week, a hurricane touched down in the United States in Florida, Georgia, around that area. It went through South Carolina, named Hurricane Debbie in South Carolina. Residents there get a little warning when hurricanes are approaching from the gray man. If evacuation orders don't inspire you to flee the wrath of a hurricane, Perhaps a shadowy figure plucked straight from low country lore will do the trick. The legend of the Gray Man, a translucent cloaked figure who appears on Polly's Island, South Carolina, when a massive storm is due to hit the coast, is one most Carolinians have heard of. Though decidedly spooky, the Gray Man is hardly a boogeyman. Unlike other spirits of legend, this ghost serves a wholly altruistic purpose to save lives. It's a story I heard growing up, said Ryan Fontaine, a Polly's Island resident. I think everyone in the Low Country 
has heard the story, especially when hurricanes or tropical storms begin to form around our area. It's always something you hear people bring up. He's a friendly entity. Not that it's a good thing to see him, but when someone does claim to see him, it gives us locals an idea of what we're dealing with. For superstitious locals, an appearance by the gray man is a good sign. Is as good a sign as any to evacuate the area. It is said that those who heed his warnings will ride out the storm safely with their property undamaged. Some residents of Polly's Island believe that he was most recently stirred up from his lumber as Hurricane Florence approached in 2018. Then again in 2022 as Hurricane Ian neared. The gray man was seen again just last week as Hurricane Debbie went through South Carolina. A couple of sightings were reported on Myrtle Beach. There are a few different origin stories regarding the fabled gray man, many of which involve a lovesick sailor returning from sea. One tale suggests that he is the ghost of a young man who lost his life to the deadly quicksand that engulfs the marshlands. His heartbroken lover couldn't bear the loss and would often walk the beach alone. One stormy day, she saw a figure that looked just like her beloved. Without any fear, she approached him, but he disappeared after telling her to leave the island immediately. The second legend says that the gray man is the spirit of Plowden Charles Generet Winston, the owner of the Pelican Inn, one of the grandest houses on the island. Plowden, a wealthy rice plantation owner, fell in love with Emily, the beautiful sister of one of his friends. They were married and built the Pelican Inn, where they could escape the plantation's heat and social demands. But the two families competed over who could give the newlyweds the best wedding present, causing a rift that still lingers even after death. Regardless of his origins, the gray man continues to appear before hurricanes, warning the residents to leave the island before the storm hits. Those who heed his warnings find their homes untouched by the storm's devastation. As hurricane season approaches, people whisper his name with a mix of fear and reverence, wondering if the gray man will make an appearance once again. How about this story? This is a chapter from Phantom Messages by me and William J. Hall. This is called The Vanishing Patient from Room 18 by Jennifer Bergeson from Vernon, Connecticut, and this happened in 2003. Jen didn't know her grandmother well, being adopted, I already screwed up, being (laughs) adopted. I'm not starting over again, that's funny. Neither did her mother. Nevertheless, she always seemed to be watching over them. In 2003, Jen's mother visited a psychic named Naomi. She didn't provide much information other than a message that was coming through particularly strong. Naomi saw a tall, dark-haired woman holding a baby. Jen's mother interpreted this to be her mother and the baby her sister. While still a baby, her sister tragically drowned in the bathtub. The psychic told her the lady was giving one message. Life is not long. Life is short. The dark-haired woman pointed at her mom while delivering the message. Fast forward to 2010. Jen is 37 and working as a phlebotomist in a trauma center at St. Luke's Hospital in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. We often received alerts from the overhead speaker for stroke and sepsis alerts. When you heard those messages, you immediately hurried to the room that generated the alert. Usually the room is full of medical personnel, Jen explained. On Saturday morning around 11 a.m., Jen received an alert for room 18. When she arrived at the room, something struck her as odd. There were only two nurses, not the usual assembly of emergency assistants. A nurse was in the process of pulling a white sheet up to the patient's chest. The other nurse was at the computer station. Looking at the nurse by the bed, she asked, Am I in the right room? 
The nurse said, Yes, you're right when you're supposed to be. Just then, the nurse walked out of the room. Chen thought that was odd, too. Co-workers and friends acted strange. They acted as if they didn't know her. Responding to the sepsis alert, Jen preps to obtain blood cultures. As she went about her routine, she glanced over to the old man on the bed. He was extremely pale, in his 70s, and sported long white hair with a matching white beard. He was unresponsive. Jen could barely see his chest move beneath the sheet. She feared he was close to death. She put the tourniquet tightly onto his arm. He didn't blink. He wasn't looking at all. As she readied the needle for his arm, he suddenly shot up, upright in the bed, and looked into her eyes. Jen put her left hand on his right shoulder and comforted him. You're in the ER. I just need to do some blood work on you. He reacted by lifting his left arm and pointing his long bony finger directly at her face and spoke, You think life is long? It's not. Life is short. Settling back down, she drew his blood, Jen explains. This man came in as a John Doe, so I had to scan his wristband to keep all of his information in the main database. I scanned each test given so we could later manually enter the results when that information is received back. I sent the blood to the lab through a system of tubes, like the ones the banks used. Still, bothered by his cryptic words, I went over to the nurse's station for about ten minutes. The same nurse was there that was there in the room earlier with me. Hey, Jen, how are you? she asked. The nurse acted completely different from when they were in the old man's room earlier. Across the hall from there, Jen could clearly see into room 18. There was an empty, freshly made bed. No patient was there. Jen inquired, where is the man that was just in that room? What's going on with him? The nurse responded, he's been gone for three or four hours. That couldn't be. Jen was just in that room with that man less than ten minutes ago. Confused, Jen explained what happened next. I ran down to the laboratory to check on the samples I sent down there, the cultures, tubes, records. We looked to find them, but there was nothing to be found. In 2011, Jen found herself back in Connecticut working at St. Francis Hospital in Hartford. She suffered a breakup and left her job and house behind. Those were difficult times. Jen told us I was texting my mom on break at one of the lowest points in my life. A picture of my grandmother was received during our texting conversation. Jen replies, Mom, that's a great picture of Grandma. It's my favorite. Mom texts back, I didn't send that. I didn't even have that picture on my computer or on my cell phone. An instant mystery was before them. Jen knew she didn't send the photo someone else did or no one did it just showed up we could never figure out how that picture uh appeared on our phones knowing that i was going through this tough time i understood this to mean it was my grandmother telling me i'm not alone and everything is going to be okay because she is here with me and we actually shared the picture that came across on her phone in the book and I will send that to you, Junebug, and maybe we could post it on, uh, underneath the episode in comments. Thank you. If objects such as UFOs and airports such as mysterious falls of fish enter our world from another dimension, may not people of some kind live there too? For centuries, people have reported seeing elves, fairies, and other man-like creatures seem to inhabit a world closely connected to, but not entirely part of, our own. Such reports continue to come in, but perhaps the most coherent account of a visit from elsewhere comes from Mrs. Anne Atkins of Devon, England. Her story is unusual because, unlike most such sightings, there was apparently a very real purpose behind it. One day in 1977, she was walking in a front drive 
to her house when a gnome stepped into view. It was quite a shock, she says. He communicated with her telepathically. The gnomes wanted some kind of organization to represent their interests. Mrs. Atkins now runs Gnome International, and the grounds of her home have been fastened with model gnomes of all kinds. This was not the only time that gnomes appeared. On one occasion, an international convention of them arrived for several days, an event that her husband also witnessed. This message is disarmingly simple. That we should try to get into harmony with nature, for having done that, we shall be in harmony with ourselves and each other, and will no longer plunder either the earth or our neighbors. Gnomes are traditionally guardians of the earth, and are manifestations of the spirit of rock, just like salamanders are of fire, or nereids are of water. But are they creatures from another dimension? Mrs. Atkins adds an intriguing detail about the gnomes she saw. The hoods of the male gnomes were pointed, but the female hoods were spiral. This indicates their origin. The pointed hood symbolizes above, and the spiral symbolizes within. A place that is both within and above this world may coexist with it, but it is surely on another plane of some kind, and some people apparently are able to perceive it. People think I'm crazy, and I don't really care. But that's what I think about Bigfoot, Sasquatches, stuff like that. They have the ability to just pop in and out of our dimension. I don't know why, I don't know how. But that's the only thing that makes sense to me. They can't just constantly be in our woods and stuff like that and go undetected. They just pop in whenever they choose to, and then they leave before someone comes and sees them or whatever. They come and grab a deer, get a little snack. And then they go back to where they came from. Those balls of light people see whenever there's a Bigfoot around or anything, I think that has something to do with it. They kind of become those balls of light as they enter our dimension or leave our dimension. Something to think about. It's like what our friend James Scott saw. He saw this white, hairy thing run out of a cave and into a tree. Just like it was running up against a tree, but when it touched the tree on impact, it's just like little sparkly things going around and the Bigfoot hairy monster thing was gone. It teleported. Did my dog teleport? My husband and I always let our dog out to pee right before bed. She used to be scared to go out at night, so we started rewarding her with treats. She still will always go out and run right back in fairly quickly. There is only one door to the backyard, right off our kitchen. We shut the door behind her, always to keep the AC running during the summer. A couple of nights ago, we let her out and shut the door, and I went to get her treat ready, keeping my eye on the glass door for when she would run back. My husband and I stood in the kitchen and chatted while I kept eyeing the door. Sure, she would be back in any second. Well, a few minutes passed. We just figured she would be back soon. She always calls at the door to let us know she's back anyway. We said we would just start getting ready for bed and come back in a couple minutes. We go into our room and turn the light on and bam, there she is sitting in our bed. We both let out audible gasps. It was a jump scare. How did she get back in? We both have no memory of letting her back in and even if we did, she would have run up to us to get her usual treat. We can't make any sense of this. Doggy. Hello, In Dark Places listeners. This story includes urban legend, maybe a ghost, maybe another dimension. So when I was a kid, I lived across the street from a big stretch of woods, and my ultimate goal every day when I went out is to find arrowheads. 
His dad told me my grandmother was an Apache. Decades later, I discovered that was not true. But my dad even built me a teepee in our backyard, and his nicknames for me were Indian Skulls and Little Hawk. The town I grew up in, Hamden, that's in Connecticut, was purchased by the Quinnipiac tribe in the 1600s, so I was able to find quite a few arrowheads. From our picture window in our living room, we could see the Sleeping Giant in its entirety. Sleeping Giant is a mountain range that looks just like you'd imagine, a giant, but lying on its back. It also had a legend surrounding it, which terrified me when I was a kid and intrigued me. My dad told me, that this was the story, that a giant roamed the land hundreds of years ago. The giant had quite a temper and terrorized all the townspeople. The, to the townspeople came up with a plan. A huge feast of food and drink was prepared for the giant. He ate and drank it all and fell into a deep slumber. He still sleeps to this day and is now covered in hundreds of years of forest growth. And I kind of grew up with that story and even went to Sleeping Giant Junior High School, which after <laughs> just a couple years ago, I realized I went to a junior high school named after an urban legend. Kind of cool. Anyway, the woods were also my shortcut to school. Even though I was only five years old, I was considered a walker since I lived less than two miles from my school. One fall day, I was crunching through the leaves while walking home from school and encountered a Native American fella leaning on this ancient, barely standing wooden fence which cut through the woods. He had no shirt but a band of some sort around his left arm below his shoulder. He had long, straight black hair, and his right elbow was resting on a fence post. He was only about 20 feet away from me, and appeared to be looking into the distance, and seemed to be in thought. He did not have a ghostly appearance, a ghostly transparent appearance. He was as solid as I was. I wasn't scared for some reason, but, but sort of frozen. I stared at him for a good ten seconds. I got a good look at this fellow. He turned his head and looked in my direction and tilted his head a bit, almost like he was just as confused as I was. Then he just disappeared. I still wonder if he was a ghost or was he real because he did interact with me or was I a ghost to him and our realities just overlapped for a bit. So this is my story, one of my stories, a partial chapter from Mr. Haunted Origins, and Junebug also has a chapter in this book. But anyways, that actually happened to me, and I didn't think till later years, I thought it was a ghost. When you see something that doesn't belong there, you just figure it's a ghost. But that guy was as solid as I was, and imagine I can imagine in his time, suppose it was the 1700s or something, he saw a little little nerdy kid with glasses and tough skins staring at him. He's like, who's this little kid out in the woods over here? He doesn't belong here. Anyways, that's my story. Thank you. Man, I love that story. That's cool. Those ancient Indians would stare into fires and stuff like that and just kind of travel in between dimensions. Kind of freaky. And every time I hear that story, I'm reminded about an insanely similar story that I heard on the Confessionals podcast. Tony Merkel told a story just like that, and I can't find the episode. But if you can find that, let me know where that is. The story is called Time Froze. I had just gotten off the bus and was waiting for my light to turn green. I had my headphones in, and I was just jamming out, and then the light finally turned green. None of the cars were moving, so I assumed there was an ambulance. I took one of the headphones out to listen, but I didn't hear any sirens. So I looked around, and not a single person or car was moving. This lasted for about a minute. Finally, I figured, hey, I'm going to go. And as soon as my foot hit the pavement, everyone started moving again. The cars, the people, 
It was like time stopped. And I got this unsettling feeling in my stomach. As if it were all waiting on me to make the first move. What made it even more unsettling was everything was quiet. You know how people say when everything goes silent in a forest or the woods, you run? Usually means something predatory is in there with you. That's what it felt like. Experiencing the same day. This weekend, I went to the city to do some sightseeing, and I saw the same people from when I visited that part of the city a few months ago. Both times, I was stared down by a multi-generational Muslim family, and I noticed them the first time because the grandma had a cane. I'm sensitive to the stare down because I'm brown, tattooed, with a pixie cut. After I passed them, I saw myself checking out a cute guy waiting for the light to change at a busy intersection. But I have seen that guy before at the same light a few months before. There were two girls with large hiking backpacks who were struggling to keep pace going uphill. I passed them again like I did before. I only noticed them because one of the girls had a hiking backpack similar to mine that's now discontinued. When I visited a few months ago, I came to eat at an Italian restaurant, but my inner voice was so certain that I wouldn't like it, so I didn't go inside. This Saturday, I decided to end my curiosity and went inside, but it smelled foul, like dirty water, so I turned around and left. I can't shake this eerie feeling of why I would be so certain that I wouldn't like that restaurant. I have had deja vu before. But this is different. Running deer into a portal. In July 2016, I was returning from having a meal out with some co-workers. It was about 9.30 p.m. I was using the usual route I take to get home from work and I left the M1 motorway onto a roundabout and took the exit that leads to the village I live in. The road I take is about a mile and a half long, and it is quite steep in parts, with fields and hedges on one side, with some stone walling. All the way up on the next village, and on the other side of the road, is a pub, a small farm, used, I believe, as a house only. And as the road gets steeper, on my left is a wooded area, with fields after that. The trees are dense with foliage at that time of year. Those fields to my right always look beautiful and golden in the summer, and I absolutely love driving that road at certain times of the year, at certain times of the day. The light was just stunning because the day had been hot and it was all muted colors. Still and beautiful and warm. At 9.30 p.m. there is little if any traffic and no farm vehicles to get stuck behind. As I approach the steeper part of the road, I changed down a gear because of the tree line at that point it's slightly darker on that part of the road. I very suddenly noticed the movement to my left and when I turned to look I saw what I can describe as a huge deer running alongside my car keeping pace and with its head turned staring in at me. A lot of things were going through my head. I was concerned I would run over it. Would I be in some kind of trouble with the police? Was it dangerous to me, and could it damage my car, make me crash, etc. It ran with me for no more than a minute, but suddenly rose slightly and shot off into the tree line to the left, and as it did, there was what appeared to be, the only way I can describe it, some kind of weird, wiggly mirror, similar to a mirror with water on it, and that was it. I've been asked a couple of questions since I wrote it down this morning, so for clarification, I did not have missing time. I did not see the animal actually run into the mirror thing. I think it must have, though. I did not feel or sense any different in the environment, like sudden lack of animal noises, etc. It was pretty still and humid, but that was the kind of day it was. It didn't so much frighten me as to make me think, what happened? I was not afraid of driving that road again, and I do it very regularly. It has not changed me, but it did open my mind up to another kind of experience. So what do you think? Parallel worlds? Different dimensions? Glitches in the matrix? What are these ghostly creatures? 
We are woefully out of time for the show this week, and we will be back next week. Thanks as always, Jimmy Haunted. Thank you for listening. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.